Welcome everyone to another Coding and Philosophy podcast. We are in a special place. Mm-hmm. We're in special the, venue. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're in the, the headquarters of Tree. Uh, this is where he plans all his, all his plans and mm-hmm. all his schemes. Yes. He uses this as his headquarters. This is uh, where so he's plotting the East Asian takeover. Exactly. Asian. With all Finnish people. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of international. So we're in Framerys uh, Club Room. We're in the Framerys Club Room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And today, uh, just before I turn on the mics, we're gonna discuss or something which blew my mind, mm-hmm. which is why aren't we more appreciative of the technologies that we use? Well, who are we? Are we talking about? <coughs> well, I know I don't appreciate it. So <laughs> <laughs> I know it, I know as well because when I, for example, go and pay by my card, I do mm-hmm. that every single day. Yeah, I it just. It's a second, and if it doesn't work, I get frustrated. If it asks for my pin, I get mm, like, "Come on, yeah. what are you?" Doing? I get frustrated, which I shouldn't, because what happens is actually ridiculous, mm-hmm. Com- mm-hmm. ridiculously complex. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I was explaining about. I found this image. I'll actually do a bit of editing. I'll put it on the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, so about this image which is uh, how every single network request mm-hmm. happens. So when you go to a web page, uh, uh, what I see is it expands the complexity of a simple model client server request that mm-hmm. as someone who start out their web development learning journey mm-hmm. has come across that model, but the model you are showing us right now delves deeper into what's under the hood, yeah. that connection. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm guessing Tree that you're probably the one who's like lowest on the web development journey compared to Yuho and myself. That's right. Yuho, I think you have the most like actual real world web dev experience than both of us. Mm-hmm. I've kind of got it like a little bit of it, but I've got a head start due to the infrastructure background. So to you me, all this stuff is stuff you do work at the cloud, and for yeah. me, I don't do much with the internet mm-hmm. these days. But I'm more dealing with the computers and the. Mm-hmm computer system and architect rather yeah. than the network architect. Yeah, so you're going kind of down the stack and I've been going kind of up it, right? Like <laughs> I started with TCP requests and now I'm up to HTTP and you're kind of like... Doo, 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 doo. Yeah, but yeah. these understanding of internet definitely helps with my work because mm-hmm. we frameware are building an IoT system which mm-hmm. we need to connect to true yeah. to a server, mm-hmm. to the cloud, right? So mm-hmm. the understanding of the internet helps me with that. Mm-hmm. So fire yeah. it up, guys. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do agree. There's so much complexity that we just do not appreciate oh, at yeah. all when it comes to anything in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Like, as, as you were saying. There's an all. infinite level of complexity. Mm-hmm. And we take things at an interface level, or mm-hmm. user interface level, if you will. And in order to appreciate that, let's try to go down deeper in the rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, so just to explain this graph, what is happening, uh, I'll recite it. So just each time you, let's say you go to a web page, uh, facebook.com, what is happening is that your computer first talks to your network card mm-hmm. saying like, hey, this IP would want to go to this domain. Or it first needs to figure out like which IP does this domain connect to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it's so a whole other subsystem. Yeah, which is design. not even on this graph, but yeah. basically that's right. From the computer to the network card, you need like an instruction set mm-hmm. and converting those instructions into binary to communicate with Bingo. the network card. You got it exactly. Strictly yeah. speaking, IP addresses are a real thing that we're talking about with networks. And IP is all zeros and ones. Right. And the domain names that we actually see, like Facebook.com or whatever. Like, that's all a whole other system called the domain name system. Mm-hmm. And all it does through the entire world is map those domains onto IP addresses, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's a lot tougher than it sounds. Yeah, it makes it more human-friendly. Yes. Because even though computers could remember IP addresses, it's kind yeah. of hard for us humans. It would be easier to remember Facebook.com yeah. instead of 112, what, I don't know what it is, <laughs> uh, the IP address. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the that's the first step, and yeah. to even blow uh, blow 
even more minds. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they, they are engineers who work with only one of these chain. interactions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, one of this chain mm-hmm. deserve a career out of its own. Exactly. Exactly. So they are just engineers who work with yeah. the computer yeah. and network card interaction, mm-hmm. basically. Or if it's some node yeah. deserve a career of its own, some people <laughs> work solely. Yeah. Make a career out of a network card. Or and I, I had a, I had a friend whose dad was a lawyer, and his dad always said, "Everything is a world unto itself." Mm-hmm. And I always think about that when I see things like this. Like mm-hmm. just a single note on this is an entire, like, level of career. Right? There are guys at the top of their fields in every single one of these. Mm-hmm. So, and the thing which I always uh, have to remind myself whenever I'm doing coding and I get frustrated and go like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I want to do? But then I start to really break it down that the fact that not even coding, but just the fact that each of us have a a job in tech Mm -hmm. is the amount of infrastructure that had to be built before that to Mm -hmm. happen is mind numbing. Mm -hmm. Um, Just it's just layers on top of layers. I mean, you have absolutely. Like, um, so how dare Let's I? That again. How dare I? <laughs> or we be uh, uh, ungrateful of that? Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. <clears throat> They're not even tight layers either. They're leaky layers, right? Every single layer could have things go wrong on them, mm-hmm. and yet somehow it all works <laughs> well enough for us to get all the way up. Yeah, that's what blows my mind. <laughs> it's like whoa. <laughs> But also, uh, the, it's not human nature to mm-hmm. just uh, start to devalue or not appreciate these things. Because if this was constantly in my head, or like, let's say mm-hmm. if you wanted to contribute to one of these uh, uh, mm-hmm. like parts, and you would need to learn all of the parts beforehand, mm-hmm. it would like limit the progress we can oh, make. Yeah. So You'd never get there, not in a lifetime. <clears throat> exactly. So that means that human beings, we have to take things for granted in mm-hmm. order to, uh, well, build things. We have mm-hmm. to take, yeah. even the electricity, uh, yeah. I don't need to know about how the lights yeah. in this world. Wo- it trust me. Yeah. It's a deep, 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 yeah. and complex and broth. Yeah. yeah. You I mean, I kind, I kind of know what they are because I got that electrical engineering background. But like, mm. but maybe <laughs> taking things for granted is a little bit harsh. It's true. I yeah. was advocating for the terms user interface. Mm-hmm. Mm. The user yeah. interface. We are the know, user, and these are all our you know, interface we're dealing with. You know, a thought just occurred to me. You guys know Plato, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is the philosophy and coding about, you know, Plato's the forms, right? The perfect, mm. like, there's the perfect form of the chair. Right, and every ch- is this news to you guys? This is news to me. Yeah, okay, news to me. all right. So, I'm sorry, I'm going to hog the spotlight for a okay. minute and explain. Please do, please do. This is a TLDR in Plato's forms. Mm-hmm. Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, believed that we never learn anything. Learning is a process of remembering things that we knew from the time before we were born, mm. when we were still floating in the ether. It's all reminiscing. And he thought about this because he thought to himself, when I look at a chair, I know that it's a chair. But why do I know that it's a chair? Well, there must be some ideal chair that I was acquainted with in the life before this life. And this chair must be some kind of imperfect substitute for that perfect chair. And that's the form of the chair. An inheritance from that idealistic class. Mm -hmm. And there's an old story, too. Uh, it might have been a C.S. Lewis story where he was going around to all of the animals uh, that God was going to put on the earth. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to give, you know, you're the snake. I'm going to give you poison fangs because that's what you asked for. You're the porcupine. What do you want? I want sharp quills to defend myself. I'll give you that. And then God eventually gets to human beings and he says, what do you want? And human beings said, well, I figure that you must have made this baseline form for a reason. So I don't want anything. I'll take just what you give me. And God said, that's the right answer. That's why I'm giving you the brain to see the forms. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. For, I, <laughs> I forget that this is not really commonplace philosophy these days, but it used to be commonplace philosophy like 30 or 40 years ago. Okay. So, Well, it's, it's uh, kind of... We did talk about this idea of... Um, 
do you or that there's the unconscious part of your brain and your mm-hmm. conscious conscious part of the brain yes and it could be if ideas have people instead of people having ideas mm-hmm. all the ideas in the world that a person could have or anyone could have mm-hmm. already exist in the unconscious part of the brain mm-hmm. and then they just make themselves known mm-hmm. by basically picking you as their champion and yep. then revealing this you know making kind of emerged out of the void emerges right. out of the void to yes. the conscious part so you can have that thought mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it does kind of... There is sort of a resemblance there, right? Yeah. There's this idea that's floating around out there in some more abstracted realm that somehow, through Ether some process... Ether realm. I want to use that <laughs> word for now. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, there's some net of ideas, mm-hmm. right? Perfect ideas floating around the ether. Let's call it the ether net. But yeah, the ideas appear to your brain from somewhere, and you got to ask yourself, like, well, where did this idea come from? Where does the idea live? And you could very easily get back to Plato's forms by thinking over that long enough. Mm. Well, Plato's forms fell out of favor in philosophy for a long, long time, right? Because it's kind of a it's kind of an out there idea. It's like you're yeah. telling me there's a perfect chair. Where is it? I don't see it. I right? It can be turned into an academic um, subject. Yeah. can approach it academically and scientifically mm-hmm. so people just discard it because yeah exactly oh, right yeah like modern machine learning for example right you show it a million pictures of a chair it more or less knows what a chair is right mm-hmm. so it's a, like an inference yes. bottom-up approach bingo and the plato's proposition is a top it's more of a top-down top thing down yeah approach. right mm-hmm. and that's By an way, interesting way to look at it shall we tr- continue traversing the link list sure Uh, the this, computer. I will yeah, finish what computer. I was. Gonna, I was going to ask. Yes. What is the form of the internet? The form of the internet. Yes. Is this? What is the internet? Yeah. But maybe we should explain this a little more before yeah. we get into that. So. Uh, well, I mean, this it's too <laughs> complex to even answer the form of the internet because that's the thing. It has so many. I'm just using this as, and all of these you can break down into bigger and um, no, smaller mm-hmm. parts, mm-hmm. but just. Um, Uh, yeah, so to explain this graph, yeah, it goes to the network card, the mm-hmm. request. You're going to, oh, this IP wants to go to facebook.com. So mm-hmm. I need to first figure out, okay, where is this IP address? And then it goes to the ISPN, uh, OSP, mm-hmm. and goes, oh, hey, here's a task, actually. And the ISP goes, okay, let me kind of give it to, from, okay, here's where my knowledge stops, or like maybe starts, I don't mm-hmm. know. From what I understand, there's tier one and tier two ISPs, mm-hmm. meaning tier one ISPs are your, let's say, each country, like we in Finland, we have Elisa, mm-hmm. and I think in America, they have Verizon. Yeah, Verizon, yeah. Comcast, stuff like that. Tier ones. So yeah. tier, those are tier one IP, ISPs. So in order for me, in, from Finland, to connect to a, a, an American server, mm-hmm. uh, those ISPs need to talk to each other mm-hmm. somehow. somehow. Yeah, so that's where the tier two ISP comes mm-hmm. in, which is basically someone who knows all of these big uh, internet survivors, mm-hmm. uh, internet service providers mm-hmm. all around the world. So they know uh, Verizon, they know Elisa, yeah. they know I don't know what the one is in India and in China, but anyways. Um, so the tier one ISP communicates with the tier two, mm-hmm. saying like, "Hey, could you figure out?" Where in the world does this mm. IP or domain kind yeah. of map to? And <clears throat> then uh, I th- that's I think that's where the uh, the domain name is transformed into, or it transformed into an IP address. Mm, not exactly, but it is a similar system. You still mm. need all that infrastructure to do it. Mm. So uh, I mean that the I think the tier one mm. I, I, ISP. Mm-hmm talks to a DNS resolver yeah. and then goes, hey, uh, can you figure out what IP this domain yes. name maps that, to? That's, that's much closer to the picture. Yeah. But it does have to be translated into an IP address before the actual request ever leaves your network card. So there's this whole mm-hmm. first request mm-hmm. that has to go through the pipeline. Mm-hmm. And then once your domain is resolved, then you can do the actual request. But they both have to go through those ISPs, as you were saying. Mm. Right. Everyone needs the cables to talk to each other. It doesn't matter what you're trying to figure out, basically. Yeah. 
and then well once that uh, once the basically computer knows of mm-hmm. the IP uh, then it needs to travel this whole journey to the right data center mm-hmm. which the server is it's I don't know in some big server room somewhere and then it goes to the server cluster which is a specific area of servers in that mm-hmm. giant uh, server room and then it goes to the load balancer which might be let's say it's it makes sure that not too many requests are taken by yeah. the same server so that it doesn't block mm-hmm. and then it finally goes to the server yeah. so it and that server then responds it doesn't have to go through the same way mm-hmm. but it just respond, response yeah. Yeah. based on the request exactly mm-hmm. and the request basically change because the uh, it's like you can think of it this whole process as a passing of notes yes a passing of data a yes. passing Thing. of notes or yeah. passing of yeah. tasks let's say or so that the computer and uh, when it con- uh, by interfaces with the network card mm-hmm. it's not it knows that the network card doesn't know uh, that it it doesn't have the answer to where's the IP located mm-hmm. at so it doesn't need to have yeah that or it doesn't need to kind of involve yeah. itself with that part of the uh, request if that makes sense yep it's like it's a one big request and each each like yeah each of these kind of handles their own part in it mm-hmm. if that makes sense it's kind of similar to like when people say like well i don't know what that is but i do know who to talk to to find out exactly everyone is doing that that's mm-hmm. in a nutshell that's what it is I don't know what the answer is but I can fig- I know a guy yeah. basically I know that's and I would pass the information yeah. to that guy yeah, yeah. Mm. Nice. and sometimes I that see. guy is just uh, you know the router in your room and sometimes that guy is like yeah. you know a tier two ISP who <laughs> footed the bill for a giant undersea cable 50 years ago right <laughs> you know, but you're just passing it off all the way all the information yeah. yeah so yeah but just this is one example of why we should be more appreciative of the technology and i was thinking more on general terms mm. so i was walking the streets and i saw this guy he didn't have legs mm. but he had those metal legs prosthetic. prosthetics mm. but he was carrying a really heavy backpack mm. and I, I, it got me thinking how man that's really something because let's say 150 years ago that mm-hmm. guy would be on the streets begging mm-hmm. there's no way he can work in a factory yeah uh, which was the thing to do at the time. Mm-hmm. You needed your limbs to be able to work, to be mm-hmm. able to contribute to society. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but now, because and and this is a whole other topic, but mm-hmm. because we have the internet and because we have computers, mm-hmm. which are even more accessible day by day, we can have people with no arms using them and people who are blind using them mm-hmm. uh, as we're building a more accessible internet. It, I think we know we are the computer. We are a part of the matrix. <laughs> oh, <I'm> go on <laughs> yeah so well, it, it's just uh, we uh, we provide opportunities we, we just that's what we're basically doing with all these technologies we mm-hmm. provide more opportunities or more opportunities to work more opportunities to do whatever you mm-hmm. uh, kind of desire yeah. in a way and something tells me that computers was invented first and foremost for military purpose to decrypt well co- yes to decrypt uh, code i think the enigma the machine is what you're talking about right the, the thing that alan turing was that's in yeah, yeah in the world war ii so uh yeah it creates an opportunity to well yeah it, it does create i mean the, ori- the original enigma machine was created for war but you could argue that I mean, look, the math was already in place, right? That's the important thing to me, right? The computer was going to happen one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that, you know, if there was no World War II, you'd still have computers in the modern day. Yeah. It might look very different, but I think you definitely would. Yeah, and also I think uh, when there is that term that all, all the great inventions uh, mm-hmm. started out as military technology, Yeah, I think... That it may be true, let's say, back in the old days, but as we're moving into a more, like, I think we're becoming more peace, peaceful year by year as a mm-hmm. humanity, yeah. because, well, globe, it's just makes more sense to not fight for resources. That's mm-hmm. really costly. Mm-hmm. It makes more sense to kind of collaborate mm-hmm. uh, and build this world econ- economy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think 
it's not going to be the case, or at least it's not the case anymore, I think. The great inventions that we have, like AI wasn't, for example, it didn't come out as, oh, it, it had nothing to do with the military, right? The open AI and all this stuff that we... Uh, that yes, is that is correct. Hmm. If you really want to stretch it, you can probably make the comparison, but you'd have to go back like 50 years or so yeah. to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Artificial, artificial intelligence is a study field that is much older than me or any one of you guys. Yeah. It dates yeah. back to a long, long time ago. It dates ago. back to like at least the 50s. But like you're talking about like how OpenAI does their stuff. Like, yeah, that was yeah. all done in public, right? That's yes. all business, mm-hmm. basically. Business. Right? OpenAI didn't even really do anything revolutionary exactly, but they had a lot of capital that they could throw at one single problem. <laughs> And so, like, they, they just doubled down on what they already knew was kind of going to work. And now I got GPT-4. Yeah. And now I never write code by hand again. I, yeah. so. Amen to that. Man. <laughs> now you work at a more abstracted level. This is true, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I recently took a job as a software lead at another company here in Finland. And so you're just kind of ascending the levels of abstraction. That's abstraction. Yeah. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. Actually, my wife is actually starting a college for computer science next week. So we're both kind of ascending the levels of abstraction there. Mm-hmm. I guess I see it as like, well, the phrase that my wife and I always use is like, we're trying to seek prosperity, right? right. Now, prosperity is a thing that is, it requires you to be yourself wealthy and trying to improve your own wealth and condition. But it's bigger than that. You also got to improve the lives of the people around you. Around you. And technology. The phenomenology. Exactly. Phenomenology? Yeah. I've never heard that word. Well, when you walk outside, right, and you see all the beauty of nature here in Finland, right, and you feel good, right, you have a, you just have a, a feeling of contentedness, right, and peace at heart when you see all that. That's kind of a phenomenological view of why Finland is such a good place to live, mm-hmm. right? Moment to moment, it's just incredibly enjoyable here, mm-hmm. at least as far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so about phenomenology is that... You know the word phenomenon, do you? That mm-hmm. means an mm-hmm. event that you, as a person, why do you look at code? Why do you look at the technology-related content? Why do you mm-hmm. look at the, the concepts of interneting? All of the things you observe actually pulls back to you and then form you as an individual that... You are the one who can deal with the programming related stuff. You are the one who do front end web technology and interneting. Those things that you observe is the phenomena. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it okay. Kind of like yeah, I see where you're going now. Pulls yeah. back to you as an individual. Yep. In the middle of those observed field, the phenomenon mm-hmm. is the experience. In other words, right? Mm-hmm. The the sense experience. So I'm basically just a magnet for the phenomenon that... And you are uh, the center of it. Yeah, You're I'm not s- just a magnet, mm-hmm. you are also the agency. Yeah. And date back to my comment on Andrews that you make the life of other people improve, therefore your life improve. That mm-hmm. is phenomenology because the things that you got to observe and experience increases mm-hmm. and leverage and ascend in experience therefore you amidst of those feel also got Mm -hmm. transcend as well yeah there's kind of a feedback loop going on there right if you make the lives of the people around you better well then you're by definition living close to people who have better lives than they did yesterday and so your life is going to be better like even if it's just kind of passively right yeah Mm. yeah it also relates to you being more experienced and being more involved in the web technology field. Mm-hmm. Just take example of two years ago when you're working as a web developer, the phenomenology you got to observe is the is React codes. Mm-hmm. It's a pile of React source codes. Mm-hmm. Now the things you got to observe is the complexity between the client and server requests that's the thing you got to see changes mm-hmm. but involves deeper details more things mm. so god i think i see mm. what you're getting at here so it's almost like earlier you were you doing reacts earlier in your career yeah okay so 
if I'm, I'm going to try to recast what you're saying just to make sure I got it. You're saying that in essence, Yuho had like the spotlight of Yuho's attention, let's say one or two years ago, was focused mostly on React, mm-hmm. right? And the he got codes. A, yes. Mm-hmm. And he read a lot of React code <clears throat> and got a lot of very hands on experience with that. That's right? right. That's right. And now it's been kind of turned. The spotlight has been turned towards some other subject, and now you're taking in all the details of that other subject, mm-hmm. right? That's sort of the phenomenological approach that you're speaking of. Is that spotlight metaphor? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Gotcha. So it basically goes through in phases. I mean, yeah, well, mm-hmm. it makes sense to me. Right. Yeah. Okay. We're using phenomenon in a in a loose sense here. There's another concept if you want to get deep into it called noumenon which is kind of like Plato's forms, Mm -hmm. right? Phenomenon is the stuff you experience. Noumenon is the things that are. And these two things are never the same. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different (laughs) different angle. Dates, I would trace back to the thread of discussion before Mm -hmm. we pull into the phenomenology. You were saying that your wife is starting computer science next week and wanting to escalate the life not mm-hmm. only by a, of us but yeah. escalate the life of people surrounding us yep yeah. and like I think personally that I've always seen as you have to start somewhere and it's usually going to be pretty low on the level of abstraction yeah but the hands on if you will yeah you got to start at the hands on level no matter what right it's very hard to just immediately leap up to the point where anyone's mm-hmm. going to trust you with like the really I mean talking about going into the software engineering field starting mm-hmm. from the low level is yeah. that true I actually have a, so maybe I'm biased because this was my route. Mm-hmm. I basically just tried to figure out what would a company need. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, okay, so I didn't exactly do this, but this is what I recommend people do. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not a preach. I don't practice what I preach. <laughs> but if you want to get into the software engineering field, mm-hmm. I think the best way is you talk to whatever software company or whatever company that is doing some type of things related to technology. Mm-hmm. You figure out, okay, what is it that they exactly need? They might just need, let's say, a React developer. Mm-hmm. They don't need to know about anything about anything else but just mm-hmm. React or, or, or a very a small part of this what um, developer advanced like developer. should know yeah, yeah or someone who's been in the industry yeah. for a long time uh, knows yep. they don't need to know but they only need to know react and then yes. you just learn that tool that technology mm-hmm. and then you go work and then while you're making money mm-hmm. then yeah. you're kind of uh, kind of well just being in a technology company or being around techie people mm-hmm. is gonna widen your knowledge yeah. so but you're still kind of you're still being useful. You're still mm-hmm. being, let's say, uh, there's utility in you. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the the hardest. Or oh, I I think it's always correct to be to have utility. Now, if you go mm-hmm. to school and you study for I don't know three and a half years or four years, mm-hmm. you might not be useful during those years because you're just learning. Uh, you're just yeah, learning stuff and you're kind of consuming, yeah. uh, let's say, resources, mm-hmm. but you're not producing them, yeah. mm-hmm. if, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah, actually, but my egg is like incubating an egg. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you mean. That's a metaphor because while you're consuming information, you strive to be some things much more mm-hmm. by the end of the process. This, the process like you've of got some consuming. focus things that you're trying to yeah yeah the process of consuming information and mm-hmm. processing it and making it a mm-hmm. part of you is the same metaphor at incubating mm-hmm. an egg there's an egg it needs incubation in order for it to hatch into mm-hmm. a new form yeah i get the feeling that three much like myself is very heavily informed in how he thinks about the process of learning and acquiring knowledge and skills epistemology yeah Yeah. (laughs) like we have a very similar epistemology in this regard like for me it kind of came out of learning how machine learning works at a deep level and i was like oh and really okay so just focused attention really is all you need for basically anything like you can become good at anything if you have enough of that Mm -hmm. um 
I'm not sure where you got it exactly from. Like the idea that you can just focus on things for a long time and practice them and then like, you know, you're going to become good at it one way or the other. Like there's not really any special trick to it, I suppose. Just paying more attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of agree. Kind of agree. Yeah. There might be little tricks here and there, but I don't know if there's a whole, there's enough of them in the world. But I'm letting the conversation get frayed. When I came to Finland, I actually had the exact same approach that you described here. My focus was simply not on React, it was on infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I came to Finland and I was like, okay, I have this degree, but I also have made a pretty surprise move to another country. I have thrown away basically all of my professional connections from the States because they just weren't going to help me at this place. How do I start from what feels like I have a college degree, but I'm otherwise at ground zero. I just got a bunch of books and I started reading through them. And I picked up one book that looked interesting to me. And then I thought, okay, this has reasonable application, right? Uh, I believe that was a book on SQLite, actually, the database. SQLite. Yeah, because I thought, like, well, data <laughs> seems important, right? Yes, data coding, is You need coding, you need data to do things. And so. you just happen to know Python and SQLite come out right out of the box with Python. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not a full-blown yeah. application-level database. No. Well, <laughs> no, no. well, actually, that's arguable. Okay. But, Depending um, on the scale. Yeah. But yeah, I took a book and I opened up on SQL. I was like, well, I don't know SQL that well. And I know SQL is a pretty big deal. It doesn't require a whole lot of learning. And I, I, I know what Microsoft Excel is. So, like, you know, it's, databases can't be that different, right? And, hey, I, I actually stand by that, actually. I think it is still pretty similar. Right. If anything, databases are a little easier than Microsoft Excel because it's just static data for the most part. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, you add in triggers, that's not really true anymore. But I started with one book on a subject that I thought would be valuable, yes. and then I read through that book, I internalized it, I built a couple of things with it, right. and then I went hey, to the cool. next book. Right? right. And I just went through this path, and every time that I was looking around for a new book, I would always keep an eye on, like, okay, what do the job listings that I'm seeing say? What skills seem to be showing up the most often here? And I had like a three-tier like thing. Okay, first off, if I see a new thing, do I think that it would be useful, right? And if it's showing up in job in job applications, obviously it's going to be useful, right? So that's bar number one cleared. Mm -hmm. Number two is given what I already know, would it be easy to learn this thing, right? Like Given what I already know, is it easy to Given so what I already know, mm -hmm. would it be easy for me to learn this new thing? So, for example, if yep. you already have a concept of databases, yes, it would be easy to learn a, a database, a new way to do. Uh, is that mm -hmm. what precisely? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And if you have a concept of databases and you've read a book on a database, yep. K neighbor, K neighbors traversy. <sighs> well, K neighbors, I knew already from college. No, I like, was saying that the approach is very K neighbor. Oh yes, yes, that's what because you when yes. you say that you want to step into the next node, yes, then you utilize the one that is near to it. Yep, K neighbor the, meaning K, the near neighbor approach. Near neighbor. I had a LinkedIn yeah. post a long time back <laughs> okay. yeah. about how I did this oh, yeah. whole thing, <laughs> and three mentioned it to me, and I was like, "Holy shit, I have a fan!" What? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the okay. second thing is, is it easy? And like, mm -hmm. you got to judge this subjectively, right? If I've just read a book on databases, does it make sense for me to read a book on React? Kinda, but not, not really. really. Does it make sense for me to read a book on machine learning? Kinda, not really. Does it make sense for me to read a book on Django? Yes. Django mm -hmm. and databases go together like chocolate and peanut butter. So that's what I did next, right? <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, right? Okay, I read a data a book on databases. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I read a book on Django. Django. Okay, right, now Rambo. book number three, yeah. right? React. Is it easy? Well, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's pretty dang easy once you know how to build a REST API. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, this is a thing that uses that other thing that I built. Okay, yeah, easy enough. Let's go mm -hmm. for it, right? Very useful, pretty easy. And then number three is, am I interested in it, right? And this is the most important one because it comes at the end, right? Plenty of things out there are easy and useful, but they're just the dullest things in the world to learn, right? You're not going to stick with them. Mm. Sure. I could have learned like the COBOL programming language, right? It's dead simple. It's useful if what all you need in the world is a job because people are hiring for COBOL. But 
there's no way on the on the planet that I would be able to stick with something that boring, right? So but there, there is, I do believe there's a term uh, or I learned called ikigai, mm. which is you need to figure out in order to uh, it helps you figure out your career, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna. I can't Google it. I don't have internet. But anyways, I think the places or like what it's you. It's like need the to, four overlapping circles. Yeah, four right? or was it three or four? I don't know. One was you need to figure out what is something that is you like to do mm-hmm. and something that is useful mm-hmm. uh, I and think something you're good at is a third one in there. Yeah, and there's a fourth one I'm blanking on. Yeah, the word pay money for it, if you will. The word needs it, and the word pays money for it. I think yeah. those are separate circles. Yeah. Yes, because the so. the word needs water, but the water <laughs> industry is, you know, yeah. it's it's not very lucrative. As the world employee. needs clowns, but Pagliacci cries every time he sees his paycheck. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> clown. But the, but basically the <laughs> I'm missing something. <laughs> uh, but that's. I always keep that in mind mm-hmm. when it comes to well making moves in my career because mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff which let's say I, I'm not the most passionate about. Yeah. But it like you want to have a balance between all of those three things mm-hmm. uh, because I don't want to be a, a starving artist. I try to like oh, I wanted yeah. to be a, a a creature and character designer yeah. at first. That I remember you told me this, and I was like. Yeah. God bless you. But oh. <laughs> yeah, because that's an, a path if you're an artist or if that's your main mm-hmm. way to make money. You, mm-hmm. I mean, some do make it, but yeah. most of them live in with you know in yeah. poverty, let's yeah. say. And that wasn't what I intended for myself. Mm-hmm. So I had to sacrifice the fun of drawing art and doing that mm-hmm. for the, let's say... Uh, a little bit more money that you could get from coding, mm-hmm. which I wasn't, let's say, and that just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, depend, I wasn't, like, I wouldn't say I'm that passionate, mm-hmm. uh, into coding or, mm. I mean, it's a skill which, it's, it's not the, I don't hate it. Yeah. That's enough. I don't hate it. I don't yeah. hate the, uh, and also I really, enjoy learning about the technologies Mm -hmm. and coding is like mm, so i would put it this way coding is just one aspect of being in the tech field Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it does produce money or you can make a lot of money with it but it's not something which i'm super passionate i i do enjoy all the things around it all Mm -hmm. the technology around it yeah all the kind of uh, yeah, all the extra things, but mm-hmm. those extra things don't really well pay the bills. Mm-hmm. At least as well yeah. as coding. Well, you gotta have the coding at the baseline, right? And the extra mm-hmm. stuff helps once you've proven that you can code. But if mm-hmm. you don't have that baseline ability, it's pretty it's pretty tough to get yourself into the tech field. That's mm-hmm. always been my experience, mm-hmm. right? As you say, someone's had to start from the bottom, and mm-hmm. the bottom in the tech industry is the ability to hands on mm-hmm. program, hands on coding. Yep. Then again, I have to emphasize that how I see programming languages mm-hmm. is is the medium or the transport to carry mm-hmm. out your thoughts. Yeah. And your ability for problem solving is your thought. Yeah. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then the program and programming language mm-hmm. and the program, the software, mm-hmm. it's the manifestation of such thought and solutions mm-hmm. in your problem solving. Yeah, yeah. I've always looked. I've always liked to look at programming as like programming is the ultimate interface. The ultimate right? interface. Like you can deal. You can work with a computer in all kinds of different ways, right? You can open a Microsoft Word, and then you're working with a computer. Yes. But programming right, is right. like, oh, you're working with like the zeros and ones. Like that's that's the real, the real low level stuff. Yes. And Word, Word is the yeah a user interface that's all of the things you interact with will be mm-hmm. transpiled, transpiled into zero and ones. Yeah. And then one levels mm-hmm. deeper than Microsoft Word yeah. is Vim or Nano, right? <laughs> <laughs> Vim is good. Okay. Yeah. I, I was using Vim this week. Those is those are also word processors yeah. and they also transpile into zero and one. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. 
you got me there. I, I will admit. And then, yeah. But but what I think you were getting at originally though is like you don't have to be super passionate about the thing, but you have to make sure that you don't hate it, right? You got to be able to at least work with it, right? Yeah. I I feel that when I said interesting, I really meant like. Is there an aspect of this thing that you can find, you can get into? Right? You don't have to find the whole thing super interesting. Mm. But it is the way that I make decisions even to this day. First off, is it useful? If it's useful, is it also easy from where I am now, which is a moving target, mm-hmm. right? Or moving source, I guess. It moves closer to other targets over time. Yeah. Useful. If useful, is it easy? Yeah. If useful and easy, is part of it interesting, right? Mm. Yes. And I feel like if you got all three of those for me, that was the place where I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not going to think about this anymore. I'm just going to do it, right? And that's the real value of it, right? You don't get locked into analysis paralysis, right? Like, is React the best front end? Who gives a shit? I don't give a shit. Yeah. It matched my three criteria. I'm okay. good. I'm just going to learn the thing. Yeah. I'm not going to spend six months figuring out which front end to learn first. It's like, mm-hmm. they're front ends, man. It'll take me like less time to just learn one of them and start building mm-hmm. stuff. And I do remember that's at least when you're starting off anything, mm-hmm. uh, it's always the beginner paralysis. Yeah. Or what was the term you used? Uh, analysis paralysis. Yeah, analysis paralysis. So yeah. you're thinking, what is the best way? What Like that's the most common question with someone mm-hmm. who's starting a program. What programming language should I start learning? Python, what, hand down. <laughs> what, First Python, then JavaScript. There you go. Yeah, but just... <laughs> <laughs> it's the same... I mean, I ask the same questions. Yeah. Uh, but it's just... I, I, I consider it part of the process. But just mm-hmm. the yeah. answer is that just learn whatever. It doesn't matter because it all translates. Right, that is very true. Uh, but I do one mistake, which mm-hmm. I think people do make, and I think universities also make when they teach about computer science, mm-hmm. is they teach about it generally. Mm-hmm. And if you know about, if you're a generalist and you don't know have a, you're not a specialist, mm-hmm. then you specialists can produce. They can, um, what, what's the word? Well, they can um, contribute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, generalists yeah. generally can't yeah. because yeah. companies are looking for specialists in one like I said uh, mm-hmm. there's a company looking for a React developer for yes. example that's they a don't, very specific thing they want they yes. don't care if you if you have a, a degree and you know a, a little bit of Java and a little bit of I don't know mm-hmm. a little bit about databases and yeah. a bit of, you don't even need to know that stuff yeah. so yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do find it very interesting how eventually I do believe that dynamic starts to invert. If you go down certain routes, like Mm -hmm. I'm starting as a software lead, which means that I do need like a broad swath of skills to various levels of, you know. What does it mean, my expert, right? What does it mean, my expert? Yeah. Take example of DevOps engineer, Mm -hmm. a DevOps engineer. Take that title for example. What what is the expertise? Because yeah. there's so many level of skills he needs to mm-hmm. do. Command line and it's so AWS different from or, or any cloud technology. Yeah. Just for an example, get. A, yeah. Can so can it be ass. say that? Can you say that? Oh, I'm an expert in Git, but then I lack of all the field mm-hmm. that necessary that becomes like doesn't qualify me for this job because mm-hmm. a job actually when you think about it is mm-hmm. special uh, it needs specialization mm-hmm. it actually needs a lot a lot of skills mm-hmm. of technologies and understanding of multiple concepts yeah okay I'm gonna recount what I just said a bit or like refine it a bit more okay I think the best way if you mm-hmm. want to get into the software engineering field is to as quickly as possible figure out how can you be useful mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. you kind of develop a single skill enough to, that you can make money out of it mm-hmm. i think that's a pretty good indicator that you yeah. actually you have utility yeah. and once you have utility then you have the option of kind of becoming an expert which yeah. means that you start you know learning about yeah. things related to that but not exactly that mm-hmm. does that make sense yeah you have like this branching 
once you get there, you can keep going down that path and become an expert if you want to, right? There are other paths that will open up to you that, would you call it expertise? I don't really know if you could for a lot of these. Some of them are weird moving targets. And I think I do recall that well, last time we were at your place, three, I got into an argument with you, you hold, about how I don't believe experts are real. I don't think that term actually means anything in practice. Uh, I can you? I don't remember this. Can you I don't uh, recite it? That either. I don't remember. Was this a dream? No. Or no, is it I just think, I just yeah. think <laughs> No, I just think we remember. I was just like, I don't think experts are real. There, I said it, mm. but it's a useful word yeah. to point at being very good at a certain thing, right? And I do think that like. Focusing on one specific thing that you know there's a market for and just getting your foot in the door ASAP, mm. that's all. That's the hardest step and that's always mm. the right first step, right? Mm. Once you get your foot in the door, everything else opens up. It becomes easier every single time. Yeah. I don't know how we got on this topic. I feel like working in tech always comes back up to the forefront of our, of our collective imagination here. Yeah. But I think uh, it would be a good place to end it. It's a 47 minute episode. I need to do some cutting <laughs> so that it's a good call. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, let's see. Let's see. Let's we, see how we hmm. published this. We have been traversing the graph of conversations from this to that yeah. in a non linear fashion. Yeah. But that's conversation for you. Uh, thank you for joining us for another Coding and Philosophy episode. Uh, Shout out to Framery and this club room. Shout out to Framery. Uh, there is a pool I want to go check out. I actually brought my swimming trunks. Yes. Uh, so, see you in the next episode. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.